You have to unmute him too. Hi everyone. There we are. We did. Clive, good evening. Hi. You want me with a background or no background? I think you look great. You look like you're in the Swiss Alps. New Zealand. There we are. Okay. I'm going to uh, let you know that the attendees are now here and we'll probably start in about two or three minutes giving people time to come in. I think it's just about 528. So we won't start until at least 530. Um, you will be on mute during this uh, presentation. If you have any questions, please use our chat. Will do. Okay, from now on? Well, no, not you. That was for the people who are viewing. And Clive, Alice will introduce you, right, Alice? Yes, I will. And Alice, you're Alice Knapp? Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me clearly as well? You look, you sound great. You look great. Uh, you always say that. No, it's true. Just a minute. I'm just going to make this announcement again um, for the uh, people who are listening. If you are just arriving, um, we will be starting in a few minutes. Um, we will be recording tonight's program. Um, if you have any questions, please use the chat function. Thank you. We have a quite, quite a few number of people are just joining. It's so exciting. We'll start in just a couple minutes. Uh, meanwhile, if you have a question during tonight's um, program, just please use the chat function. Alice, you did say it was a one-hour lecture, right? Yeah. <laughs> it usually, um, uh, once you have people start asking questions, it usually ends up being 45 minutes or so. But <laughs> yeah, your talk is 21 minutes, Clive. Uh, you're on mute. Sorry, Bob. Okay. Yeah, a little bit depends on pace, but it's about 21. Okay. It might be, I could probably get it a little under 20. It's a bit more than the 17 I aim for, though. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh. <laughs> Are you ready to go? Uh, yeah, I think so. All right. Um, we, we will be recording tonight's program. Um, Mason, could you start the recording all set all right welcome to the ferguson library civility series actually i i miss said that because we've been doing this for um almost eight years now with the dylan schneider group and hearst media um it is one of our signature series and you can look at all of our past um civility lectures on the ferguson library's website um Tonight is going to be special. It's our second one that we're doing as a Zoom webinar. It's also being shown streamed on YouTube. If you have any questions, please just feel free to put it in the chat and you should know that it is being recorded. Tonight, we are very fortunate to have Clive Meanwell. 
who's an MB, CHV, MD. He's the executive chairman and founder of Population Health Partners, which aims at technologies which work for millions of people with common conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, depression, and lung diseases. Clive's background is in medical research focused on epidemiology, I knew I was gonna mess up that word, statistics and clinical trials. He led the development of multiple first-in-class medicines for heart disease, infections, cancers, and pain associated with surgery. He started his career in England as an NHS hospital doctor and university research fellow. Afterwards, he moved to Roche in Switzerland and the United States where he held a range of R&D, regulatory, and commercial leadership roles. He then started the medicines company and and has been a director and vice chairman of BB Biotech and chairman of its four subsidiary funds. In 2014, Clive was appointed as an advisor to the US president on strategy and organization of the FDA. He has served on the boards of the United States Biotechnology Industry Organization and the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturing Association. He has received multiple industry awards, including the Dr. Sol J. Fair Award for Vision, Innovation, and Leadership, and an Ernest and Young Award for Entrepreneurship. And we are so delighted that you are here tonight. Welcome. Thanks very much, Alice. It's great to be here. Well, I'll get started then. And uh, thank you to everybody for dialing in, tuning in this evening. Partway through the 21st century, we're once again struggling with dynamic and uh, powerful forces of nature versus human fallibility. Arri arrival of a novel virus and its pandemic spread and disease burden seriously challenges science, knowledge, truth, and beliefs. But it also tests civility. These last 10 days, we've witnessed other struggles in America. Uh, perhaps a topic for another day, but I want to express my deepest sympathy and sorrow for all who've been killed, harmed, falsely accused, or otherwise let down. I've also got to declare a conflict of my affirmative bias. My profession is life science as a physician, scientist, innovator, and investor. I'm energized by our purpose and our progress, and I can tell you the knowledge is growing at an astonishing clip. And I'm highly optimistic that we will prevail in this natural struggle. Now, if you had wandered into a certain general store in New Haven in the 1750s, you might have spotted an almanac. It was published by the owner, uh, a shoemaker merchant who on the side studied math and astronomy. In among the forecasts of moons, eclipses, tides, weather, and actually intercolonial exchange rates of all things, was plain spoken New England civility. Public good, it said, is preferred before private interest. The owner was Roger Sherman, who went on to become Connecticut's representative to the Continental Congress. The only man to sign all four founding documents of the United States of America. Despite his almanacs, he wasn't in the same linguistic league as Jefferson. However, uh, declarations must eventually become practical, forming government and getting things done for the people. Uh, that's when he came into his own. I'd say we could use a Roger Sherman right now because life has been taken from 107,915 Americans already by today, liberty in its pragmatic sense is all but denied, and the pursuit of happiness, well, Jefferson's expression of the American mind has stalled. Facing a uniquely 21st century crisis, will we mistake imaginary for real happiness as Locke warned us, or will George Washington's last great experiment succeed? driven by his surest basis of public happiness, knowledge fostered by science. Science moves us forward in three steps. It creates knowledge to improve estimates of truth. These estimates engender new beliefs. 
which in turn inform choices in the pursuit of that happiness. Science focused on the heavens during Sherman's time. Copernicus, Bray, Kepler, Galileo, Newton, and Messier had all created vast tracts of new knowledge, estimated truth about the positions and movements of the earth, moon, and other celestial bodies were published in many, many charts and tables. They rearranged beliefs over 150 years, despite Lutheran and Catholic misgivings. But kings, queens, governments, bankers, and entrepreneurs seized the day. Their belief in reliable navigation encouraged imperialism and fueled the dominant merchant economies of the 18th and 19th centuries. The science of life moves us forward in a similar way. Sherman himself uh, was quarantined during a Connecticut smallpox outbreak, which killed 20% of those infected. Meanwhile, across the pond, Edward Jenner carefully reported his estimate of truth that vaccination with cowpox was safer than variolation with smallpox. He was close to dead right. 40 years later, English Parliament passed laws making cowpox vaccination compulsory for newborns and free of charge. By the way, failure to comply carried a one pound penalty. That's about 150 bucks today. People in Wuhan came down with mysterious pneumonia last year. The time and place of infection and how it hopped from animals to humans is still a bit unclear, but 44 were logged with the WHO on January the 3rd. Newly named SARS coronavirus 2 was detected in 41 of them, and its genetic imprint fingerprints uh, were published just eight days later. Within weeks, we knew patterns and mode of viral transmission, who it most frequently kills, and how they die. Life scientists were already pretty clear this meant a lot of trouble. Up to this afternoon, 6.6 .6 million confirmed cases and 386,000 deaths have been reported worldwide. A lowball estimate of truth. A colossal scientific movement is underway to generate new knowledge about this virus and its effects. Warp speed has been requested from Washington. A 15 minute review isn't feasible or desirable, so I'll focus on just three questions. How do we see the future? What will reduce deaths among those who are infected? And when, when can we get most people protected? We see the future with models, the same way that Sherman saw the future of the tides in New Haven. By February, models of earlier epidemics foretold that SARS-CoV-2 would become a pandemic. Most policymakers accepted that estimate right away and made some pretty hard choices. Few people, however, were happy. Models predicted that social distancing would flatten the curve so that even inefficient hospital systems wouldn't be overwhelmed. The price of ventilators and personal protective equipment rose dramatically. The curve did indeed flatten and some ventilators and most of those masks were used. Despite though the overall veracity, the models were found imperfect and that led to more unhappiness. But we have to remember that science only estimates truth. When we're in a hurry or look far ahead, the data can get pretty messy. Three uncertainties limit predictions for SARS-CoV-2. First, we don't know if infection produces strong, long-lasting immunity. We haven't counted yet how much in asymptomatic infection is around. And at least in the free world, uh, perhaps uh, happily, we won't ever know everything about interpersonal behavior and social distancing. We used two flavors of model, forecasting and mechanistic, and at least seven renowned scientific groups with masses of experience are working on these models around the world. 
The renowned statistician from England, George Box, who was once president of the American Statistical Association, ran the stats department at the University of Wisconsin. On evenings such as this one, he held spirited seminars at his home with Pabst Blue Ribbon, the local beer, on tap. Between swigs, Box reminded his students, all models are wrong, but some can be useful. This evening, we should raise a glass to that. A few drugs will reduce deaths among those infected. So far, 210 candidates to prevent or treat COVID-19 have been named in scientific journals. A whole lot more have been named on Facebook and Twitter. Our best science builds on clinical study methods used by James Lind, a Scottish physician in the English Navy. In 1747, while Sherman made shoes, Lind did the first controlled trial in the history of medicine. The test medicines he used were really hard to swallow. Sailors with scurvy were given cider, drops of sulfuric acid, vinegar, seawater, spices and barley water, or two oranges and a lemon. Results were clear cut positive thanks to careful methods, but you know, Lind was lucky. The effects of vitamin C were so obvious that a few dozen miserable recruits proved the point. The British Navy stocked all their ships and my American friends call me a limey. With COVID-19, we shouldn't rely on such luck. So with great relief just last week, we welcomed the first scientific reports of the first large controlled trials of, well, I should say large-ish controlled trials of COVID-19 treatment. One for remdesivir, the other for the famous hydroxychloroquine. Both were published in the venerable New England Journal of Medicine. So what did we learn? Well, remdesivir is an injected drug that we already knew stops coronavirus in test tubes. For the last five months, Dr. John Bagel of Baltimore led a trial comparing remdesivir with placebo in adults who had COVID-19, including pneumonia in hospital. Courageous patients, their caregivers and researchers didn't know if remdesivir or placebo was being given, but an oversight committee kept an eye on results and they stopped the trial early because the results no longer supported the belief that it was okay to give placebo. How could they be so sure it worked? Well, no one can ever be sure in science, but the ratio of patients who recovered on remdesivir versus placebo was 1.32, an improvement, if you like, of 32%. Statistics would show if the trial was done over 100 times, the improvement would be anything from 12% to 55%, 95 out of 100 repeats. Those are pretty good bounds of confidence when looking for truth. And so the FDA approved remdesivir within a few days. Just yesterday, another report, this time for hydroxychloroquine, the 100-year-old drug that some people use recreationally. It's known to impair entry of coronavirus into monkey kidney cells held in test tubes. Since mid-March, Professor David Boulware from Minneapolis, of all places this week, compared hydroxychloroquine to placebo in people exposed to someone else in the household who already had confirmed COVID-19. Could hydroxychloroquine, he asked, protect people from getting an infection from one of their cohabitants? It didn't, at least not with any estimate that could support belief people assigned hydroxychloroquine got infected 2% less often than those given placebo. But side effects were reported 23% more with hydroxychloroquine than, than the placebo. How could they be sure this time if this trial were repeated 100 times? Well, the result would fall between an actual increase of infections by 2% on hydroxychloroquine 
to a decrease of up to 7%. That's a wide range of confidence when looking for truth, especially when the increase in side effects would be seen 99 out of 100 times. We probably don't need to give hydroxychloroquine in this situation anymore. But does this mean remdesivir is always good and hydroxychloroquine will always be bad? No, no. Fortunately, more good science is on the way even larger randomized, trial, randomized trials are being done in the, by the NIH, the University of Oxford, INSERM in France, and the WHO. We can watch for the more estimates of truth from these trials. Uh, they'll help make happy choices. So when can we get most people protected? When 70% or more of the population is immune to SARS-CoV-2 or thereabouts, it'll afford herd protection to those who are not yet immune. Where are we in that quest? Well, because we're still cranking up testing, we're again using models. Uh, These suggest infection rates that are 10 to 100 times the official numbers. But even this estimate leaves us at only 15% infection rates far, far short of the 70% we need for herd protection. Then why not get it over with? Let everyone get infected. Well, we know this is about 10 times more deadly than normal flu, more so in vulnerable people. The exceptional 1918 pandemic killed 30 million people in 24 weeks. This one is capable of similar carnage with a different age distribution, older. So with no social distancing and no vaccine on our way to herd protection of 70%, I'm afraid to say the model still suggests we'd see about a million dead Americans in six months. It's a terrifying estimate of truth. Effective social distancing will probably keep us below 20%. But of course, it'll also ruin the economy for good. And so a vaccine is essential. Failure is not an option. As of this week, 199 vaccines are in development. 35 will start clinical trials this year and 15 already have. Almost all the attempts use the infamous spike protein, a little blob on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus to provoke a human immune response. Most of the efforts, about 70 of them, isolate or make that protein and inject it. Basically, it's the same way Jenna did cowpox. One example from Novavax wraps the protein in a tiny soap bubble to increase responsiveness. A brand new vaccine technology from Moderna, given us two shots, evoked strong immune responses in a handful of healthy young people recently. Partnered with the NIH, they expect to start a 30,000 subject trial in July. Others, such as the Chinese firm CanSino and the Oxford Jenna Institute, use bioengineered common cold viruses to transport the SARS-CoV-2 protein spike genetic code into the body. First results from CanSino in 108 patients were reported last week in The Lancet. But side effects were frequent, most likely caused by the common cold transporter. But a sound immune response to SARS-CoV-2 was thankfully reported. So that's quite promising. But most experts see a 12 to 18 month timeline to first vaccines, even ambitiously. That means Moderna, who started up a while ago, could succeed in early 21. Enormous economic and political pressure will probably prompt interim reports. I'm gonna guess that some of them are gonna be demanded before November the 3rd. But a good estimate of truth, if you go that fast, will be hard to pin down if they're made too early. Whenever it is, in relative terms, this is all indeed happening at warp speed. Here's a sobering benchmark. Paralytic polio was first described during Sherman's lifetime. It took 119 years to identify the cause 
was polio virus. 40 more years to grow it in a test tube and 13 more years beyond that for Jonas Salk and Albert Sabin to make a vaccine for worldwide use. That's 172 years. Modern science and strong funding is moving us along about 150 times faster. How fast? How fast can emerging estimates of truth shape wise choices? Can we continue with the last great experiment with civility shown by the founders? Well, the answers are fast and yes. And even we become a better society if we do this. Here's five ways to try. Number one, despite unhappiness, we mustn't lose faith in models or modelers. While wrong, their improving estimates of truth are useful. Plus, they're believable and actionable. Two, in God we trust, but everyone else must share pedantically their estimates of truth to make, sell, give, or even take new medicines without careful science is gambling with life. Trusting gut, luck, or quackery, no matter how skilled the demagoguery, should be disallowed. Number three, we must collaborate with others at risk. That means everyone on the planet, even enemies. Napoleon had his entire army vaccinated struck a medal in Jenner's honor and released detainees at his request at the height of the pan-European conflict, one year before his Waterloo denouement. For most leaders, science, knowledge, and truth are very valuable assets in a crisis. Number four, we need to get ready for equitable distribution of vaccines. They're coming. And this is gonna be the ultimate test of civility. Normally, high-income countries, and within them, economically blessed families get the first shots. But as Bill Gates said recently, during a pandemic, vaccines and antivirals can't simply be sold to the highest bidder. So in the name of life science, let's start with healthcare and other essential workers and people most at risk. By the way, they're easily identified by the marks of PPE on their faces or standing in lines for food and other assistance. And in the name of economic science, let's buy some bonds from countries that need cash for vaccines and identify with digital means the 1 billion people, 1 billion most uh, in developing countries, I'm afraid, who need a vaccine more than others. And finally, we've got to quit calling earnest scientists estimates of truth fake. They're not right, but if we do that, we won't prepare for the inevitable, inevitable next time, which we must prepare for in three ways. Have great policies, people, and resources ready to respond on tap. Fix disparities in healthcare, which make pandemics worse, and reverse the 20 year decline in innovation for chronic diseases. You know, the ones that kill even more than pandemics, except year after year after year. Many Americans today feel let down and hopeless. To this English life scientist who came because of boundless opportunity here 24 years ago, the situation is deeply sorrowful. Unalienable rights claimed here 244 years ago and the experimental methods to exercise them are today more valid than ever. SARS-CoV-2 and its terrible disease, COVID-19, is not the last pandemic. Modern science will doubtless lead us out of this 21st century mess faster and with greater good than at any time of history. But then what? Well, we can be better with equitable estimates of truth, driving actions which increase happiness for all. Almanacs like Sherman's relate to the future. Public good is preferred before private interest. Thanks a lot, Alice. Well, you're welcome. And I already have a, um, a question. So right now, if the audience do have questions, please put it in chat. Um, the 
This question says, the president's warp speed project for the development of a COVID-19 vaccine suggests an approach we might call vaccine nationalism. Do you think the race to develop a vaccine will become an international competition? And if so, will an eventual vaccine be distributed fairly and efficiently? Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to say it is a competition because that makes us all get up in the morning even more uh, attentively. But I'd be reluctant to accept it as, an in, as a national competition, a bit like, you know, like the Soccer World Cup or something. Because even though we have a World Series in America that no one else plays in, it's worth reminding us that this is a World Series of pandemic that we've got to win. And everyone has a contribution to make. I mean, there are, there's amazing science coming out of Europe, amazing science coming out of Latin America, coming out of China, coming out of India, as well as Washington and the rest of the United States. We all need to pool this know-how to get the most um, effective, safe, and ultimately efficient protection. Um, there's no way of knowing today who's gonna win this. Naturally, the American women's soccer team always win the World Cup, but it's not natural that America will always win the scientific cup. So I think we should get in the same rowboat with everybody and start uh, pulling the oars hard. A, a, a global effort that's coordinated has ultimately everyone's best interest in mind because we just don't know who's gonna win, no matter how much money we spend. All right, we have a couple more coming up. How long do you think it will take until we know if people who are asymptomatic but are testing positive to the antibodies are protected from contracting it again? That's a super question, of course. Um, some people now have recovered, uh, you know, maybe five months ago. Certainly some people in China and Italy and places like that are, are, are doing well. There are disturbing signs that some people have residual illnesses of various strange kinds, but it does seem that at about five months, you've still got a, a, a tighter, if you like, a level of immunity that's, that's working. That, that seems to be the case because, of course, we're taking blood from people to give to their fellows who have got new infections. So we're out to five months and it's looking good. I think most expert immunologists believe it'll last a year or so, um, maybe longer. But I think certainly when it comes to transferring this information to vaccines, this definitely looks like an annual shot, not a once in a lifetime shot like some other vaccines we have. So probably it'll protect you, if you've had an infection, protect you for a year-ish, um, uh, but it would be good for everyone, even if they've had a, an illness before, probably to have a shot. What steps can we take to prevent future pandemics? Um, this is a very interesting question because if it literally means to prevent them happening at all, I fear that we're not gonna have many good answers. You know, viruses have been with us on the planet long before we came, and they're awfully adaptable, and they can live in all kinds of places, in all kinds of animals, and they've shown an aptitude for hopping across to humans every now and again, almost at will. I don't think we can stop that. I don't think we could tag and, and catalog every single virus in the animal kingdom that exists, because there are probably billions of them, and, and many of them we've never even seen or heard of. So I don't think we'll ever prevent pandemics, uh, certainly not viral pandemics, uh, that, you know, by, 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 should we say, socially distancing from animals. Um, it's a risk to, to hang out with animals, but unfortunately it's a risk that most people in the world can't avoid. Uh, here in New York, uh, you only have to go to the zoo, but you can avoid them otherwise. But most places you actually can't. So our preparation for pandemics is probably more important than our ultimate ability to prevent them happening altogether. It's good to know because I'm a huge bat lover, but based on your medical knowledge, where do you think this came from? Did it come from a lab or was it a natural crossover from bats? 
Well, I have a few friends who know a lot more about this than I do in, in various roles, and even they are still speculating. Um, the simplest story, which is why I didn't uh, describe it in my brief remarks, um, is probably not true. It probably didn't hop across in, in an animal that was infected in a, in a, in a food market. That, 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 that's sort of gone by the wayside a little for the scientists because it seems like this virus has been around a little longer than that. By the way, the vintage in terms of its animal um, origins is probably in the 50s. So there's evidence that this virus has been in the animal kingdom for quite a long time. Well, uh, maybe not so long in relative terms. Um, but how it flipped across, um, it, it, it still could conceivably be that a, that a laboratory worker caught it, working on it in one of these one or two special labs that work on coronaviruses. That, that's not completely uh, impossible. Um, it does seem very unlikely based upon the virus itself that it was engineered you know, for viral warfare, which I know a lot of people have shown concerns about. So not sure it happened in that market, uh, but it probably wasn't intentional. It was probably a mistake. So this is the last question that I have here. So if anybody um, would like to ask another question, please send it via chat. Since scientific discoveries are a result of hard work and yet serendipitous, is it a mistake to think superfunding a few pharma companies is wise? No, that's not a mistake. Uh, super funding a few pharma companies is never the answer. Um, even though once you've got it underway and you need to scale it up and make a ton or two, that's a great time to give pharma companies money because they're good at that. But this notion that we, uh, the sources of innovation, sources of discovery come from large organizations is, is, is not backed up by data. Eric von Hippel at, uh, MIT has done lots of work showing that the sources of innovation come from multiple, multiple sources, often from users of, of projects and products, and certainly from academia, NGOs, good ideas from the public. And all of those sources when we're at a war like this uh, need to be tapped into. So no, uh, even though there's some brilliant work going on in, in the pharma industry and in the biotech industry, and ultimately, they'll probably be the people who scale up these, just like they did after penicillin was found and, and, and perfected. When Pfizer made most of the world's penicillin in Brooklyn, um, but they certainly didn't invent it. I think that combination is really powerful. Um, discovery everywhere, and then funneling to global manufacturing and distribution channels um, subsequently. The problem is it all needs money. And I don't think it's wrong to give big pharma companies money if they're using it wisely. Uh, I do think it's wrong to channel that money away from uh, discoverers. All right, we did receive a couple more. Um, will the vaccine be a live vaccine or a dead vaccine? Do you think? Ah. <laughs> Do you think compliance will be high or will vaccine skeptics forego the science and take their chances? Um, it'll probably be a dead vaccine. Uh, in fact, it'll probably be part of a dead vaccine. I, I don't think we need the whole thing. Although live um, uh, vaccines have been, you know, traditionally quite uh, powerful, quite, uh, uh, quite successful. But remember, uh, here we're dealing with a pretty deadly virus and I'm not sure I'd want to take a live vaccine necessarily. So I think it's going to be a dead one. Uh, uh, it's more likely to be a fragment of one and it might even be a genetic sequence from one where you yourself, as with RNA and DNA vaccines, make the, you become the, the virus, if you like, you make the protein inside you. You're never given the protein. You're only given the genetic code to make the protein. And then when you make that protein, uh, your own body recognizes that you're making a, a you know, foreign protein and you develop a, a, an immune response. So probably in my mind, not a live one. The other part of the question, I'm just trying to look at it again, Alice, can you help me back to that question? Yes, and we got a, a, a second one person asked the same thing. It's in essence, how accepting of a vaccine do you think people will be? Well, I've seen data which suggests that only half of 
half people who, who, who are polled say that if they were offered one, they, they, they'd accept it. Uh, you know, what, what do we normally do? We know that with flu vaccines, if we make a real effort to educate people at risk, such as the elderly and the young, uh, we can get up to 60%. Uh, but on the other hand, the consequences of flu are not always understood to be that 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 uh, damaging, even though they can be. Um, here, I'm hoping that we can hit that 70% number of coverage, as it's called, simply because we've all learned so much about this in the last um, five months. I'm hoping that we won't forget the learnings, uh, that we won't be complacent. Uh, particularly because if we can get over 70, then me having a vaccine, Alice, also protects you if you can't have a vaccine. And I think also remembering that there, are, there is now evidence that this virus is dangerous in a small number of children. And I think none of us, and perhaps that's why the British government first passed the, uh, the acts for uh, uh, newborn babies in the 1800s, that at the end of the day, all of us want to protect kids who are born without immunity, perhaps, and who are exposed early in their life. Uh, even if that's infrequent, it's something to completely uh, wipe off the planet if we can. So, you know, people say 50%. I hope we can convince more than that, and I hope we can get above 70. We are getting information from so many sources these days. Who do you think is the most reliable source of science-based information for us lay people? Well, uh, what, what a, an important remark. Um, I, I think even for people like me who are sort of generalists at best, uh, not deep experts in the field, um, we're struggling too. Um, the scientific literature is exploding it was, it was okay in February and March because it was all so new. And in fact, I remember remarking to friends that I didn't think we were uh, mounting a strong enough um, assault, if you like. Uh, boy, was I wrong because it's now, a, it's, it's, a, it's, we're drinking from a fire hose in terms of new knowledge generation. Uh, papers are coming out every single day, important papers. I mean, not you know, typically in a domain of science like heart disease or infectious disease or cancer, you know, you might see you know, an important paper a week, every couple of weeks that you really have to read carefully. Today, we're getting half a dozen every day that we all ought to be reading from stem to stern. So for everyone, there's a bit of information overload. So where, where's the truth? Uh, where can it be distilled? I still believe that the source of numbers that's reliable is the Hopkins website, which everybody can see. You know, our dashboards are not perfect, but they are put together skillfully. And so I think if you want to know the state of play, I think the Johns Hopkins dashboard gives you the numbers uh, pretty well. And, and uh, since we're already well above six and a half million cases, you know, a few hundred missed here or there is not quite so important as it was at the beginning. In terms of therapeutics, uh, there is no easy way. I, I think at the end of the day, and it was it, four hours ago, a paper that had been published by the Lancet of all journals uh, two, three weeks ago was retracted because a sudden belief this afternoon, it was actually expressed a few days ago, that, it, that they got it wrong, that they may have even fudged the data, which I think is appalling in a situation like this. It's a, it's a dreadful uh, uh, reflection of, of, of madness or, or pressure, one of the two or both, uh, are for publication. It, it's a reflection of the kind of stress the scientific community is under. And if we're not careful, we go too fast, we get very, very sloppy, and then we have to start retracting things. And that gets political. Suddenly, our science and our politics get a little bit conflated. And you start talking about opinions more than facts. There's nothing wrong with political opinions. They're very important in the way we run our world. But we would hope that those opinions could be uh, uh, built on, 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 on carefully checked facts. I deliberately use the word pedantic in my remarks because uh, you just can't take your 
eyes off the ball when you're doing science. Uh, we've learned over hundreds of years that when we get sloppy, it gets dangerous. And, and this is certainly true. So, so what to tell people? Um, if you see in the headlines a clinical study that has been accepted and published by the New England Journal of Medicine, any of the nature journals, any of the Lancet papers or JAMA, I think that's, uh, if you want to select anything to look at, it, it's those, because the quality of those journals, the way that they put you through the ringer, usually, <laughs> before you publish something, is, is good enough, I think, to mean that we, more lay people, could say that's, that's about as good a science as we can see in the clinical domain. Now, obviously, there are many, many other excellent journals that go into the, uh, the fine print for the big books, if you like. Um, those, um, we have to trust people like Dr. Fauci to, uh, and, you know, and his team to keep their arms around and let us know if there's anything important. But I think we can follow the top three or four journals. And if you see something on CNN or Fox News or the New York Times or the uh, uh, Connecticut Chronicle that says it came from one of those journals, and I think it's worth taking a moment to figure out what they're trying to say. Otherwise, Hopkins and those, I think you get a bit swamped. All right. Is, is climate change a potential contributor to what seems like uh, increasing cases of viral diseases? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. I'm certainly not a climate change uh, wonk. Um, look, temperature change would certainly change the kind of pathogens we uh, encounter, whether they're bacteria or viruses or other types of infectious diseases. So it could, in theory, um, but that's an awfully controversial topic. I think we should deal with this one first, get ourselves off the hook on, the, on, on coronavirus, and then go back to the other labors of science, which include uh, climate change and other pathogens. It would be a brave one to put those two together and give a proper answer today. I'm really sorry. I, I'd be a bit out of my depth. I only have two more questions. Do you feel the U United Nations World Health Organization can be a fundamental leader if properly funded or staffed? Then who else on the World Front can take on this role? Well, I don't think the WHO is actually the right place for that to happen. Uh, the WHO is, is, for many of us, an incredible organization very with positive vibes about it. But it's, at the end of the day, not there to provide leadership. It's there to provide coordination and integration of information. It's a very tall order to ask a WHO official or even a team at the WHO to take on leadership when you literally have, you know, President Xi and, and President Trump and every other major leader wanting to lead it themselves. I mean, that's a very hard thing to ask a scientific administrator to take on. I do believe the world could use a small panel of super leaders who could be trusted by administrators, scientists, and politicians. And there are pockets of that, perhaps, in different nations and even some transnational efforts. But we have a big gap in global leadership here. It's one of the greatest challenges. That's why I mentioned Napoleon mm -hmm. and that story is because this really matters right now that, that you know, politics aside, scientific collaboration and coordination is hugely important right now. And it's happening round the back because um, you know, uh, scientists talk to each other even in times of um, national conflict, but it's not strong and it's not strongly enough coordinated. But I don't think WHO is gonna be able to do it. United Nations maybe. Uh, so uh, that's, that's not solved right now. And I don't have the solution unless we ask Bob Dylan Schneider to do it. <laughs> and he could do it. Um, <laughs> on a lighter note, is that a fake backdrop behind you? Or is that really the view from your office? 
Well, I'd like to tell you that I'm in New Zealand, in, 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 in the only country in the world that has got rid of the coronavirus, but I'm actually not. It's completely fake. I promise you it's the only fake thing about this lecture, though. Uh, thank you so much. Um, this was a, an enlightening talk. Um, I'm glad bats are not going to have a bad rep. And uh, I thank you so much. Um, and for those of you who would like to go back and view it again, it will be on the Ferguson Library's website. Good night. Thanks a lot, Alice. Thank you. And, and if we talk, once I hit the